Thank you very, very much. Um, this is the lavalier working okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, you'll see first off that I, re I did, that was a typo. That was a clear error through energy um, efficiency conference. <laughs> but anyways, um, um, it was very fortuitous, I think, that Susanna um, spoke before me because I, I really had considered going that route. I worked on SIPs before and, um, you know, with a, um, uh, NACs all the time, and um, and I thought about going from that perspective. I'm trying something a little bit different, as you can see. Um, the little FF stands for fossil fuel um, combustion, and I'm really approaching this from an exposure and health perspective. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to remind you about health, and I often feel that that's been my... my um, primary role in the Houston Galveston um, arena for um, 30 years or so was to like raise my hand and say, uh, can we put health on that second paragraph, please? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just keep it in there. Um, but anyways, um, so as I said, I, I'm taking a slightly diff different approach today. I'm going to approach this through combustion. Now, one of the, um, one of the um, points that, a couple points that Susanna made that I think are important um, she talked a little bit about the NACs being tightened. Well, and, and this was probably implied in what she said, and as, as she noted, every five years, the EPA is required by law, they don't always make it the schedule, but to look at the medical evidence that's out there, this is worldwide, the very best studies that exist, and see whether or not the standards are su sufficiently protective of health. I mean, that is why the standards do have gotten tighter because we understand the health effects better. Um, in general, I would say uh, U.S. health standards are still probably not quite as health protective as those in Europe and Canada, a few other places in the developed world, but they're very similar. We're, we're working from, a, from a, a, a body of knowledge that is shared worldwide and researchers that are working worldwide. Uh, another small, um, not point exactly, but she talked about NOx and its importance in ozone formation. And um, I'm actually not going to address ozone today, um, even though um, we have these two non-attainment areas in Texas. I'm going to, because I'm really focusing on what is most likely to cause health effects. Um, in, in Texas and among our residents. Um, NOx is also very important for a, um, for a particulate matter, and that, that's primarily what I'm going to talk about today. I, I know I have to scurry. But um, NOx um, and SOx as well, the gases recombine and cause what are, create what are called secondary particles, which are very tiny, ultrafine particles. Um, particles that are less than one micron, and new evidence is suggesting, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, that these very, very fine particles that are almost exclusively combustion, either primary from combustion and or secondarily formed from gases that are associated from combustion, are extremely um, de deleterious to health. And so you'll also be seeing, you're seeing right now the PM standard is undergoing review, in part because of our growing knowledge and understanding of the uh, effects of particulate matter, particularly. So, and um, I have been received indirectly some TERP money before, and that is wonderful. Um, one of my um, long-term goals to, is to get the program to also address some health studies, which they haven't done yet, but hopefully in the future. So let's see. Okay, so um, fossil fuel combustion um, is probably the biggest threat to world ecosystems worldwide and also to human health. Um, we already, um, in the earlier presentations, looked at sort of, sort of multi-pollutant and multi-emissions models as far as um, looking at how we can have a cleaner environment and, and healthier citizenry. Um, so we're looking at combustion fossil fuels for electricity. That's been a lot of the focus today. Also industrial processes, we were talking about that as far as um, EPA and, and just better processes, cleaner catalytic converters and what have you. Um, vehicle propulsion, that's cars, um, off-road, what have you. Um, cooking and heat worldwide, that is a tremendous um, issue. 
Um, the picture on your right there is, in, is a picture from India, and that's being addressed by UN, WHO, and others. But approximately 2 million um, women and children die every single year as a result of biomass burning and um, to heat and cook within their homes. And um, it's, it is an issue in the United States. It's, it's a much bigger issue generally in developing countries. Um, and there are other ways in which you can be exposed to the pollutants that are associated with combustion, such as through munitions and fireworks, um, light, cigarettes, hookah's becoming a big thing right now. So um, my students always ask me about, is it worse than cigarette smoking or not? <laughs> um, as the hookah bars start opening up. But, but from a health perspective, you have to remember that you're exposed to all these different sources. So you're exposed at different scales. So on the global scale, we've been talking some about climate change, species loss, and I want you to think about the kind of health ramifications. I don't have time to go through them all, but we, climate change as far as drought, there are health ramifications, certainly with having to do with drought. Um, there are, um, we've talked about changes in vectors, such as perhaps mosquitoes, and health-related heat, various things. Um, um, regional, um, one of the things we talked about was coal, and um, I'm su supportive of the, of the um, mercury reg air toxics regulation. Um, coal is one of the primary sources of mercury, um, which gets into, through movement into the water um, system, into fish, where it's changed to methylmercury, and then it comes out in fish, and then, and now, you know, there are guidelines. If you're um, a woman of childbearing age, or if you're a young child, you must limit um, particularly certain kinds of fish, because mercury, especially methylmercury, is extremely toxic to the developing brain. So um, that's why we have those guidelines, and coal is a big um, reason for that. Um, on the metropolitan level, we're looking, for example, siting of schools. We can tell you that um, children that are, that are close to freeways, California has, um, uh, their learning is affected, their, their, their number of days out of school because of asthma is affected by pollution, by the proximity to pollution sources, and many times we're looking at proximity to freeways. Um, infrastructure costs that we don't often include, health costs that are associated with air pollution, and I'll come back to that. Um, I'll also address some at the neighborhood level, we're looking at disproportionality. Um, some neighborhoods are more affected by local sources, such as Barnett Shale, or in, um, in along the ship channel, some communities may be more affected by, by, by trains, by diesel exhaust, by certain um, catalytic boilers, what have you. Um, at the home level, within the home, we haven't talked too much about that. We're doing a lot of stuff with green homes, with lead homes, with, um, with businesses, but we still have issues that we have to address. For example, cooking, um, gas cooking can create a lot of pollution in the home if, it's not, if the home's not properly ventilated. Um, commuting, commuting is a major source of carcinogens and also exposure to particulates and formaldehyde and, and um, carbon monoxide. Um, I'm not going to go into the increased vulnerability, but I think all of you know that um, children are not little adults. They absorb considerably more pollution. They, they breathe faster. They eat more. Um, they are just exposed overall more, and they, they, are, they are in the process of developing. So there are a lot of systems that are particularly at risk. So um, children are always a vulnerable population. And then we can go down even to the cellular level on many levels. Um, um, but one of the things we're looking at a lot now are epigenetic changes, exposure to combustion that may be associated with lower birth weights, but then are associated with diabetes and high blood pressure and metabolic syndrome as you reach middle age. So there are lots of this whole combustion thing, which is tied to our need to maintain this grid, um, but also energy efficiency so we can reduce the load or turning to alternative sources so that we can reduce the amount of combustion. Um, this is a, you've pretty much seen this before, um, but this is the greenhouse gas emissions by sector, um, most of which is urban, and you'll see industrial power stations up there, 21%. But you'll see residential and commercial down there, um, transportation fuels, of course, and then, of course, a lot of it is carbon dioxide, and we often use carbon dioxide equivalents. I, I don't think you really, this is a cool graph if you ever get a chance to look at it, but that first, that whole brown top part on top, that is all the energy sector. So when we're looking at the, the, the um, combustion gases and the effect on health, 
Um, energy is, is a very, very big component, as you probably already know. Um, and then just, um, this is just showing where Houston is as far as per capita CO2 emissions. Again, we're talking about combustion and we're talking about health. So if you look at the third bar from the right, that's Houston. So that sort of purple looking. Um, so Houston, um, air conditioned city, you know, is one of the most air conditioned cities in the world and um, it is a massive, and of course we have a lot of heavy industry. Um, we use, uh, we do a lot of, we are creating a lot of greenhouse gases and that is associated with adverse health effects. Um, this is just a, um, showing, this is butadiene and benzene, which of course are both combustion gases, but are also our fuels that go into, into combustion. This is just, um, this is, th this is showing Harris County, and this is a three-dimensional model from using CMAC, and it's just showing that for these two pollutants, and it varies for every single pollutant, of course, that we do have hot spots. So there are some neighbor neighbors that are neighborhoods that are more likely to be um, disproportionately affected by certain by certain pollutants that are associated with combustion. Okay. Um, more. Internationally, particulate matter, because it's so strongly associated with health effects, and I'm going to come back to that in just a second, is really um, the marker for public health um, and strategies to reduce global um, greenhouse gases. Um, and this is a study that recently came out in Lancet where they looked at um, what are the what we the public health benefits of reducing greenhouse gases, and they used several different models, but um, looking at reducing CO2 by approximately 50 percent by 2030, and um, in all the scenarios um, with the the um, benefits greater in some of the more developing countries where the cost of implementing these controls is still less, uh, but nevertheless, in all the scenarios, the public health benefits. And all they measured were deaths association, associated with PM 2.5. Um, the benefits greatly exceeded the cost of, of better controls of these gases. So a little bit about PM exposure. Um, there are a number of health considerations. Um, the size of particles, I already mentioned, is very important. So primarily now, and we used to look at PM 10, um, 10 microns are smaller now. The, 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 the um, standard is for PM 2.5, and increasingly we're looking at the ultrafine particles, one micron and smaller. The chemical um, composition is very important, um, and whether or not it's, it's inorganic or organic carbon, and how much other stuff can carry. So a lot of times when we're looking at PM, we're also looking at its ability to carry extremely toxic metals that are very toxic, extremely low, like cadmium, um, lead, um, vanadium, et cetera. Solubility of particle has to do a lot with where it ends up. So these very, very tiny particles, we now know that some of these ultrafine particles don't even go into the lung. They go directly to the olfactory bulb, they'll be in the brain um, within a matter of hours. Others go directly through the alveolar walls because they're so small, they're not stopped by any of our normal defense mechanisms, and they'll be in the bloodstream where they're doing all sorts of damage very quickly. Um, and then, of course, susceptibility of the host makes a difference as well. This is, these, th these, these are a couple graphs from um, the six-city uh, six study, which you've probably heard of. It's a Harvard study. It's still undergoing. It's a prospective study. Looked at six studies, uh, six cities, and it was really responsible for the EPA coming up with the, the PM 2.5 um, standard initially because the, the findings were so robust and they were challenged by industry and the, the, the findings were the same. And basically they found that, that they looked at six cities across the United States. They looked at as a prospective study, so they controlled for cigarette smoking and BMI and a number of other factors that could be associated with mortality. And they found that the city um, with the highest PM levels um, mortality was approximately depending on how you want to do the statistics, not 19 to 26 percent higher than the city with the lowest. Steubenville, Ohio was the highest, Portage, Illinois was the lowest. Um, these, the thing I'm showing here, and this is well known to people that have read the EPA um, documents for setting the standards or whose um, documents in Europe, um, but that there is no, um, there's no threshold for PM, adverse effects from PM 2.5. 
Um, it goes all the way down. It's a linear relation. The one on the right are vehicles in which they controlled for, for coal, and the, the one is deaths across in these six cities. And so you're just looking at the linear relationship. And in, in Europe, so when the standard is set, particularly for PM 2.5, um, it is set acknowledging that a certain number of people are going to die and are going to be made sick, even where the standard is set. Um, that's, that's given. Um, the two primary pathways for, and since you all should know, um, this is good knowledge to have, for ambient PM um, levels in the air, one is pulmonary refluxes, so the autonomic, this probably has to do with very quick um, arrhythmias, heart attacks, um, spasms that might lead to a stroke on one side, and the other side is pulmonary inflammation, which becomes systemic inflammation, lead, leads to, um, to a thickening of the blood, clots, and heart attack from that direction, or stroke, which of course they're both very similar. So um, those are the two primary pathways, although there are a number of others. Um, PM um, changes inflammatory, immune, and allergic response. Um, it increases the number of chemicals, so when these chemicals get into your bloodstream, I mean, this P, the PM little particles, all these things start happening, and it makes you more susceptible to infection. You increase the amount of exhaled NO, which is an inflammatory response. Um, inflammation is, is associated with heart attacks, with neurodegenerative disease, et cetera. Um, changes the neural pathways, um, and it causes vessel damage, so people like with diabetes are very at risk from, P, from PM or, or, or combustion particles. So this, I have two little studies that I was going to share with you. Um, this one has to do with um, caro the carotid artery, the artery that runs to your brain, that supplies blood to your brain. And so this particular um, study was in Los Angeles, and it looked at the thickness of the wall, the intima and the media, two of the layers. Um, so that's the carotid intima media thickness by high resolution ultrasound. They looked at approximately 800 adults that lived in Los Angeles area. And they geocoded their residential address for annual mean 2.5, which ranged from about 5.2 to 26. Our Clinton, the Clinton site runs around 15 right now. Um, it's probably going to be non-attainment. Non-attainment is done if the standard comes down. It's not right now. It's right on the edge. Um, and anyways, what they found was that for after they adjusted for all these various confounders, that for every 10 microgram per cubic meter increase in PM 2.5, the carotid arteries were narrowed by 4%, and that this um, was even more in women who were 60 years of age or older. So, and that um, also, in, in general, if you've got this inflammatory um, response, what it kind of does is you get reactive oxygen species inside the blood vessels, destroying the, the inner wall, and then you kind of get scarring. That's pretty much what's happening. But it's not happening just in the carotid. You understand that. It's happening throughout your body. Um, this is just a, um, a map of the Los Angeles Basin showing, showing sort of hot spots, so areas that had higher PM2 point levels. Mm -hmm. And this is just showing that um, lots of different subgroups were looked at. This was the um, null effect is where that line is, zero, and all, all the little, the those are the um, competence levels, but the, um, that all these different groups with women age over 60 being the first one, so about 15% um, more at risk. So. And then this one, this is a new one. This is looking at neuro, um, neurological effects. This is from Harvard. And this looks at 200, approximately 200 children in Boston, about um, average age, I think 9.7 years, something like that. And they estimated, it's a pretty um, rigorous study, and it lo looked at black carbon as a surrogate for vehicle exposure at the residence. And they did a bunch of cognitive measures, and they controlled for a bunch of different things, including blood lead levels. And basically what they found was that, um, blood car that black carbon was associated with decreases in neurocognitive functioning in a number of layers. And it was equal to about three to four IQ points, which is about the same that you see for 10 um, um, micrograms per cubic, um, per deciliter of lead, of blood lead level, or for a mother smoking during pregnancy. So, um, you know, this obviously is a concern. And so um, this is pretty much my, my sort of take-home message, I guess, is I want you to think more perhaps about combustion, um, that 
that the standards, the NAC standards are not absolute, that health effects occur, occur well below the standards. Um, that we need to meet the standards, obviously, but that's not the only thing to look at. Um, the, um, we need to move from combustion powered to non-combustion powered for our electricity, for, for vehicles and what have you. We need to move from a system that looks at taking, making waste, I think that the major talked about this, um, to cyclical um, production. We need to move from living off of nature's capital to living off nature's income, so we're more in a concert with, uh, with the ecosystems. Um, we need to move from a loss of cultural and biological diversity, which we're seeing, um, which is affecting us economically, for example, the fisheries, uh, to increase cultural and biological diversity. And we need to move from materialism to human happiness as a goal. We're moving away a, a lot from looking at health to looking at happiness, um, just because it's, 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 it's a more complete measure of health. Health is part of happiness. Um, and the things that, that are being addressed here at this conference, so I think are great, energy efficiency, improved processes, and then I always like reduction in use. If you can, you know, if you can get out of your car and get on a bicycle, there are no downsides. So, um, and I think that a number of these programs are, are looking at just getting people to turn off the lights and use less, and that will make a huge difference. That's it, thank you.